Ben Spooner, you are killing me. You keep saying that overstripping is a myth. That goes against everything I've always heard. That goes against what our vendor tells me. And my manager is saying, if it's not overstripping, then what corroded my reboiler? All he knows is we have an overstripped aiming and we have a corroded reboiler. So what caused the corrosion? Watch this video to find out what really happened. Welcome to the Experts Network. Welcome back to the Experts Network. My name is Ben Spooner, process engineer with Amy and Experts, and we are now on part three and should be the final uh, uh, episode of this topic of overstripping of amine and corrosion. How does overstripping of amine relate to corrosion? In our last video, at the very end of it, we finally got to the main point, which is that when you have uh, ultra low lean loadings, overstripped as many people would call it, uh, it tends to be the only way you can get there is if you have some heat stable salts or some kind of acid in the amine helping that regeneration. We call it acid assisted regeneration. Now it's important to understand how this works you guys because a little bit of heat stable salts is actually a very good thing for us because of this acid assisted regeneration. Um, what happens, I gotta be honest, my colleague Mike Sheelan, he's much better at explaining this than I am, but I'm gonna give it a shot because I'm down in Houston and Mike's up in Calgary. Uh, what we have, guys, is when amine reacts with H2S, say, for example, okay? In the absorber, we got uh, low temperature and generally high pressure. The reaction is very quickly pushed to the right. Um, H2S bonds with the amine. Now, what happens is you don't actually have H2S in rich amine. Instead what you have is this ionic dissociation where the hydrogen ion, that's what bonds to the amine and we call that protonated amine. Uh, and then the HS negative, the other half of the what was H2S is now just this ion floating around in the liquid looking for something to do. Okay and it's a salt. Now if we were to react the amine with, let's let's use that phosphoric acid example from last plant, very common additive to, to amines is to add phosphoric acid to it, uh, or sorry, formulated amines. The phosphoric acid does the same thing as H2S where it's got the ionic dissociation, but here for every molecule of phosphoric acid we react the amine with, we get three protonated amines. So it's very, very powerful. We make a lot of protonated amine with just a little wee bit of acid. Um, that is important because when we take things to the regenerator and we start to heat the amine up, what it wants to do is it wants to start driving these reactions back to, to the direction they came from, back to the left. Okay, the more protonated amine we have, the less that HS negative is gonna hang around in solution. It's very quickly gonna reform into H2S and vaporize out of the amine. So, to summarize, lots of protonated amine equals very low ability to hold H2S, especially when the amine is hot. Okay, and in fact, you could really summarize, summarize this by saying that you cannot have heat stable salts and H2S coexisting in a hot amine solution. This is why as your heat stable salts increase in concentration, your lean loading will just drop, drop, drop. Okay, to the point where you don't even have a lean loading. Now this normally happens fairly quickly. It only really takes around half to 1% heat stable salts to get those really low lean loadings. So a lot of people will notice that the loading is very low, but they don't necessarily know how high their heat stable salts are. Now a half to 1%, that's not so bad. Okay, that's because you haven't gotten to the point where those heat stable salts are corrosive yet. All you're doing is just you're helping yourself out with regeneration. We of course don't want the heat stable salts to continue to climb because you wind up causing corrosion and 
you have this like permanent protonated amine. That's really kind of what a heat stable salt is. When it goes back to the absorber, that protonated amine is not going to also want to react with any H2S. So you can build up the heat stable salts to the point where the amine doesn't work in the absorber. So it's, it's useless and corrosive. You're not in a good situation there. Now, traditionally, how plants monitor heat stable salts? Well, Probably the best way is to take a sample of your amine and send it off for analysis. Okay, a lot of plants don't do heat stable salt analysis on site. They will do lean loading tests on site, normally a couple times a week, but they don't do heat stable salts. A few plants we've been to do, you have to distill the amine, you have to drive all the uh, acids off. It's about a three hour procedure. You need to have very well trained lab techs. You need to have all the equipment. Uh, it's not commonly done. Okay, normally you would send it to your vendor and they a week or two later send you back the result. That's great as long as the engineer who's ever in charge of that remembers to take the sample and send it off. But all in all, it's not as commonly done as measuring the lean loading. And we're pretty sure that that's where this whole concept of overstripping came from, is people had readily available lean loading data. They did not have heat stable salt data, so they didn't really clue in that that's what was actually causing the corrosion. Uh, again, we refer you to Ralph Whelan's 2004 paper. It's just simply called The Effect of Heat Stable Salts on Regeneration of Amine. It really makes it quite clear and quite obvious what is happening. The whole concept of overstripped amine that is corrosive should have died in 2004. It's a shame that it didn't, but we're doing our best to uh, educate you now. Um, okay, sending a sample to the vendor is a pain in the and it takes a long time. We want instantaneous results. Some stuff that you can do on site are pH tests and conductivity tests and lead acetate tests. All of those kind of tell us which direction our heat stable salts are going. If we have a regular trend of our aiming pH, and conductivity, okay? And as long as we are keeping our aiming strength more or less constant, our operating parameters around the regenerator more or less constant than the pH and conductivity should also stay more or less constant. But if you're seeing the pH dropping, that can mean a buildup of heat stable salts. If you're seeing the conductivity rising, that can also mean a buildup of heat stable salts. Now keep in mind that can also mean a buildup of H2S as well. So if you're maybe not trusting your lean amine titration, your lean loading titration, you can double check using lead acetate paper. Simple, dip into the amine. If it comes out brown, you have H2S. If it's white, your amine is regenerated. So if you have this combination of lower than normal pH, higher than normal conductivity, and the lead acetate paper is still white, you do you have heat stable salts you do not have h2s okay so it's not that you're over stripping the amine and causing corrosion it's that the rise in heat stable salts may cause corrosion and you can wind up like this guy or this guy or this guy these are all regenerators that corroded the initial assessment all in all three was that they overstripped the amine that's what caused the corrosion in zero of those cases did overstripping have anything to do with the corrosion it was all due to heat stable salts so i hope that makes it clear uh i don't know how to make it any more clear overstripping is a myth heat stable salts are definitely not a myth they give us both the overstripped amine and the corrosion okay uh, that's it for this topic thanks very much for watching our youtube channel please subscribe and and uh, ring the bell so that you'll be notified of future episodes and uh, uh, of course if you have any other topics questions or comments please leave them in the comment section below give us ideas for future videos we want to give you guys the topics that you want so thanks again for watching we'll see you next time